All right, so this talk is a, a bit of an odd duck in the Project North Star Summit um, in that I am not talking about North Star. Goodness, that transition is not good. Uh, I'm talking about a side project that I've been working on in my weekends and my spare time for well, over two years now, I realized recently. And it came about because I have a, a CV1 and I wanted to use it with Linux, so I propped up and at the time the OpenHMD project had uh, support for the CV1 uh, as a three degree of freedom headset and no support for the controllers. And I thought, all right, I'll add positional tracking. How hard can it be? So the, uh, to understand what you need to do for positional tracking with the Rift, um, I think it's, you have to kind of look at the system as it works. And many of you may have a, a understanding of how the different headsets work because we all look at this stuff all the time but uh, there's some details in the the rift system that i think are really interesting they they have some very clever ideas and you know if you want to have the best system copy from the market leader with enviable uh, success so the the cv1 the first commercial release of an oculus rift headset comes with the headset two controllers and a camera, two cameras, some people had three cameras, and you put the cameras around the room and they watch the headset. You have to do a calibration step where you teach the software where you've placed your cameras and then it remembers that. Uh, and that's important information for localizing the, the position. So these cameras are watching infrared LEDs that are embedded all over the headset and all over the controllers. They're not visible to you, but they're quite visible to these IR sensitive cameras. And we have LED models for the controllers. So they're factory calibrated. They come, both the headset and the camera have in the firmware information about where each LED is physically, has physically ended up during installation. Uh, it measured in micrometers, as well as a normal that tells you how they aligned you know, right down to where they, the angle they ended up on, uh, on the PCB at. You watch, you take these LED models, you use the cameras, you watch it, the LEDs through the cameras, and then you do some big missing step that goes from observing dots of white light to positional tracking of each device. And then there is the next generation that and Quest are using, which is the inside out tracking that Northstar has that is in a sense a much more interesting target, but quite different in some ways. And it's it's uh, different in how you track the headset but then once you know where the headset is, there's quite a lot of similarity with how you localize the controllers. And given that we have inside out on the North Star, I think it's kind of interesting to look at how I'm doing localization for the CV1 controllers, because I think it'll adapt pretty well to other styles. So to do the, the tracking, you need to know your camera positions, and you can do that by getting some views of the headset in a known position and then re reversing that to get your camera positions. You run that once each time your room configuration changes. You can, to some extent, detect if something has changed, if, if the cameras no longer agree uh, about the position of the headset. You can guess that one of them moved and trigger the user to put the headset uh, back on the calibration mode and, and recalibrate your camera positions. And then from that, you have a XYZ position and a quaternion orientation for each camera that you can use for your tracking. Um, so I have a branch of OpenHMD that I'm, I've been maintaining, uh, moving it into different branches from time to time as I've gotten to different features. The current one is this Rift Cullman filter branch of, my, of OpenHMD. 
and it has quite a lot of differences compared to upstream OpenHMD now after two years of, of forking. Uh, and I've in two years, uh, only very little of what I've developed has been merged back. I sort of I did some initial work where I added controller input uh, for three degree of freedom tracking of the controllers and we merged that back. But all of the six degree of freedom stuff is still out in another branch and it adds functionality to do the radio communications between the headset and the controllers which is something i forgot to talk about in the earlier the earlier slide so there's this very important step in tracking oculus headsets where they communicate between the headset and the controllers like you would expect like a windows mixed reality headset will communicate bluetooth from the controllers to the PC. But the big difference with Oculus headsets is they are using a, a custom radio protocol that is based on um, NRF 52 microcontrollers like the like lots of Bluetooth LE devices use. But they, it's a custom protocol. So it operates in the Bluetooth band, but we don't know what the protocol is. Uh, so we can't talk that protocol ourselves. But that protocol is between the headset and the controllers, but also importantly between the controllers and uh, between the headset and the cameras. And there's, there's a broadcast signal uh, that is sent uh, 52 times per second, and that synchronizes the exposure of all the cameras with the with a, that event triggers an exposure of the cameras and also triggers each controller to turn their LEDs on brightly at the same instant that the headset is turning its LEDs on brightly. And so we have this kind of synchronized blink um, tracking mechanism where the, the LEDs are only on when the cameras take their, their exposure and each camera is taking an exposure at exactly the same instant. They're, they're synchronized even though they're separate USB devices. Uh, so back to this slide. Uh, I, can, I can talk those radio commands. We, we can tell the cameras on their USB interface, hey, you're listening to this headset ID for your exposure synchronization. We can talk to the controllers. We can read firmware blobs from the controllers over that radio link. Uh, which is kind of slow. You get sort of 50 bytes per radio packet back and it, it can, uh, you've got to read a, a kilobyte or two of firmware blobs. So there is also a nice mechanism where the firmware blobs on the controllers will carry a checksum and you can store that checksum locally and then read only those 16 bytes back and see if, the, if you already know uh, the firmware blob for that controller based on its checksum, you can use your local cache and have a faster startup, save several seconds at startup. We can access the cameras. They're basically a standard UVC camera in some ways, and they're completely broken in other ways. So they are a UVC device. If you plug in a Oculus sensor, it uh, will pop up as a UVC camera device in Linux, but if you try to access it, you get garbage because the device reports uh, that it's a YUY2 color camera. But in fact, you have to ignore that and interpret the frame buffer that you're getting as a grayscale frame buffer with twice that width. Some funky things like that. And also, of course, they have custom USB commands for, for doing the radio uh, configuration bits. We can read the IMUs from each device and um, all of the information on the CB1 protocol comes, from, you know, I came along and all of this stuff was really well understood because Philip Zabel had already done heaps of work to reverse engineer the USB protocols and uh, decipher the radio commands. So that getting that stuff up was made it infinitely easier. So then we can. We've got radio, we've got IMU, we've got cameras, and we can do HM, I can do HMD and controller tracking in my branch to some extent. Uh, I don't have a room calibration step, so what I'm doing for now is to just watch 
when you first start uh, any open HMD application, the first time we get a lock on the headset position, I treat that as zero, zero, zero facing forward and reverse the, the camera positions from that. Just suboptimal, you get a different uh, room calibration every time you start up if you're not careful. So I sort of have this startup procedure where I put the headset on a, a stool at 50 centimeters off the ground and that's my startup position every time. And more recently, I spent a weekend on the USB protocol again and found the commands we need in order to send haptic requests out to the controllers so I can do you know basic haptic uh, feedback and that's a big quality difference when things like Beat Saber suddenly have uh, reactive buzzers when you hit or miss a block. So we take all of these pieces of information and protocol stuff and I've implemented a, a tracking loop that, uh, that follows this state diagram. So the first piece of information we use is, a, is to do take the IMU data and concentrate on this fusion step. And the goal of, of the fusion step is to take your IMU information of acceleration and gyroscope and blend it together with position information. And you, you have to do uh, this kind of fusion because as many of you will know, uh, six axis IMUs like we have in the the Oculus devices give you a gyroscope and an accelerometer that can track rotation and acceleration in each axis. And you can integrate your acceleration to get relative position. But the noise in that and the error in that double integration means that your position tracking is only useful and valid for a short amount of time. So if you only have an IMU, you can only do three degree of freedom tracking really because your IMU position tr moves, it, it drifts too quickly. You, you have a couple of seconds where you can stay relatively accurate. So we take, we need to use the camera feedback to correct for the, that drift in the accelerometer integration. So we're going to have this constant balancing fight between uh, updates from the camera and in between updates we are predicting where the, the devices are using the IMU and then when the next camera update comes in we're correcting back to where it belongs. So we take camera input from multiple cameras, uh, I run a LED blob tracking step, actually I'll get to that. So I want to focus on the cameras a bit more. So oh, I've already said most of this though. The, the camera is mostly a US, uh, UVC camera. It gives us 52.0833 frames per second or 19.2 milliseconds uh, between frames uh, driven by the broadcast from the headset. Um, we have to do, uh, we have, ex so therefore we have each camera is giving us synchronized exposures, but because they're separate USB devices, we have uh, raciness and timing differences between when things actually start arriving from the USB interface and then by the time we get them into user space. So we have a have, have raciness between when IMU updates come versus when the start of each camera packet, each frame buffer starts arriving versus when the frame buffers finish arriving. Um, it, we're taking a, a snapshot every 19.2 milliseconds. It takes 17 to 18 milliseconds to actually deliver that frame across the USB to us. And um, yeah, so there's a whole bunch of stuff there. The, these notes are old for actually, this, these are sort of out of date. Uh, there was a bug when I started doing this a year and a half ago, two years ago, there was a bug in the Linux kernel that meant if you plugged in two uh, Oculus sensors and tried to use them in Linux, it would give you a not enough bandwidth available um, error that I ended up diving down. So this requires a 
kernel newer than 5.4, but that's easy to get these days. Um, and I used to have all of this camera capture and analysis stuff happening in a single thread. That's now, there's, there's multiple capture threads going on. It's been long modified. So we, remember, we don't actually start knowing anything about the, the hardware here. Um, Oculus don't give this information away. So we have to do things like read out blocks of data from the, the camera firmware and look at the bytes in there and then try and figure out things like, oh, this, this, some of this data must be the camera distortion parameters, but we don't know which blocks it is. Uh, so I, I did, you know, Philip had taken a stab, he'd said, oh, here's some floating point numbers that look like a, a matrix of, of things. You can spot floating point numbers if you, in the, the hex dumps, uh, if you, you know what you're looking for. And then I did a, an open CV calibration step with a, a chessboard I had lying around and we tried different the, the different open CV models and then found, oh yes, look here, the open CV fisheye distortion model matches these parameters that we found in the firmware. So that's great. Now we know how to do camera distortion. So now we can take the camera feed, we can run undistortion on it or in fact, I, I do it the other way around. We, we scan the frame for uh, white dots and the scanning process for the Oculus is nice and easy because we have a synchronized exposure. The LEDs blink very brightly. The exposures are, are very high speed. So what the camera sees looks like this photo. Right? They're, they're, the frame of your room is mostly black and then you see nice white dots. So we can scan across and just find bright areas and mark rectangles as LED candidates. If you have a window with sunlight outside it, that shows up as well, but we can reject those based on you know, size requirements and things. So we can get a list of, of LED blob positions, and then we can run each of those positions through the undistortion step. So that instead of undistorting every pixel, we find the pixels of interest and then undistort just those positions for and so we can do this in a, a fraction of a millisecond and in the DK2 and in the CV1 their original idea for how to build correspondence between white dots you see and the 3D model was to give you an identifier for each LED by blinking them in a 10-bit code so each LED on the headset would blink brighter or dimmer slightly and you could you got a counter in the data stream coming from the headset IMU data that you could find out what pattern you were expecting to see in each camera frame and then you could line up track the brightness and uh, of each of each blob that you see over time and then after 10 frames or so you you can get an ID for each LED and then it's easy now you for each LED you have the, the identification of that LED you know which position in the 3D model it belongs to and you can use a, a 3D um, PNP operation to extract the position of the device. But there's a problem. When they introduced the controllers we went from having 40 uh, LEDs on the headset to having 80 LEDs or so between the headset and the controllers and 80 LEDs is too many for a 10-bit pattern to reliably identify um, uh, because they're using 10-bit gray codes so we sort of we run out of blink patterns that can be reliably distinguished and Oculus stopped doing blink patterns so controllers don't blink at all so now we're in a situation where we have a whole bunch of blobs, but we don't know which one is which. So we need a way to do what we call correspondence-free registration, where we figure out which white dot we see belongs to which LED in the 3D model. It's ab initio pose finding step. And so the, we did a whole bunch of research. We looked at different mechanisms for how you can do this kind of operation. So there's 
uh, they fall into a couple of different classes. We can either do hypothesize and test approaches, or we can do sort of global optimization approaches. Um, the global optimization ones tend tended to be very mathsy and in depth and focused on uh, like sort of real world feature tracking. And I couldn't find a way to apply any of these sensibly to the, this problem. And also all of their run times are in the multiple seconds or tens of seconds kind of operations. And we need a, a method that can work in milliseconds because if we take a second to find the device each time we lose it, then by the time we've found it, it will have moved too far and we can't track, we have to start all over again. Uh, so we looked at some hypothesize and test approaches. Uh, a nice contributor from Google turned up and he built a, a soft posit um, mechanism that would, you know, take the 3D model and then it would anneal it to match up with the blobs. But again, we've, uh, you know, we took that and we found it and it ran in, you know, six, seven hundred, eight hundred milliseconds and would very frequently just fail to find a good pose uh, unless you already started very close to the final uh, correct answer. So you kind of, you had to take guesses of different starting poses and try each of them and it, but it just never really worked well. Um, I, I can't see how to make a, a ransack approach work because to do this operation of matching 3D models to blobs, we have to match up at least four blobs to four LEDs. And if you pick four at random from each of the sets of available things, the probabilities of hitting matches get too low for ransack to work in a plausible amount of time. Um, blind PNP might work, but that was also, that's multiple frames of, of tracking as a kind of approach and that. So what I did after soft deposit fell apart was to just try something much simpler, uh, a brute force search. And my approach for that is to take the list of it, of 3D model, the LED positions, sort them based on a projection of the nearest neighbors for each LED. So we start for each LED, we calculate the nearest neighbors and um, do that based on taking the 3D model and rotating it so that that LED is facing directly forwards and then projecting the neighbors uh, into the, the camera view to get a 2D distance. And then the same, each frame where we have blobs, we take the list of blobs and sort those based on proximity. And then do a brute force search, taking groups of four LEDs and four blobs uh, in sequence and just trying to extract position from three of those blobs to validating against the fourth position. If that matches, we have a viable candidate, perhaps. And then the next step is to take the gravity that we're detecting using the IMU, using the accelerometer, we can know which way up the device is facing. And because we've already done a room calibration, we can project back through the camera position to figure out what the 2D vector of the gravity is in the camera view. And we can check that the pose we've guessed from our four matches has a reasonably close IMU gravity vector to what we expect to see. If so, this continues to be a viable candidate. And now I've got a, a step where we assess a score uh, for this pose based on projecting now every LED in the 3D model in that is supposed to be visible from this orientation. We project that into the camera frame space and match the 2D positions against the blobs that we can see inside that bounding box, count up how many match and look for the best possible matches. And my original approach for, for once I implemented this was then to do a deep search for the headset and then do a deep search for the left controller and then do a deep search for the right controller. Um, and it works, but it, all, it takes 200, 300 milliseconds to do the full search. 
So in the, the last couple of months, I've come up with a second strategy, which is a two-pass strategy where we do a sort of shallow uh, couple of levels deep search for the headset, looking for an obviously good match and very quickly returning if we can, and then doing the same shallow search for the controllers uh, if we need to. And then finally, after, after we've done this quick search, we do a deeper search in case there was a device that was uh, very occluded and hard to see or that was we, we didn't get a, a match because uh, the neighbours didn't line up the way we thought. So I do a deep search and sometimes that then finds a device we missed in the first pass. But overall, this means that the time typically we can recover the devices inside of one, maybe two camera frames worth of time, which is just way much better, way better. 20 milliseconds after the camera frame arrives, we have figured out where it is and we're only one or two frames out of date at that point. And we're quite good for, for tracking and acquiring. Um, there is a, an algorithm that I'm aware of that I could do better than the three, than this four LED search. I could reduce that um, by one LED and one blob using a, instead of matching a P3P pose and then rejecting them based on the gravity vector, I could take two LEDs and the gravity vector and figure out what the, the yaw is around that gravity vector and then use a third point to validate it. That would mean we, can, we need one less LED and one less blob, which should be a, a four times speed up in this process even. Um, then we, anyway, we do all this. We have some guess for where the device is, and now we can use, instead of taking the four LEDs and four blobs and getting a pose, we take all of them and uh, re refine the pose to, uh, of every match that we, we found, every LED to blob match now. We refine the pose, and then we can run it through the camera to room transform back to get a global position that we can feed the position into the IMU fusion, uh, which then loops back and makes a prediction the next time we have a camera frame available. So for each camera frame that arrives, we use the last confirmed position. We use the IMU data to predict where the device should have been or will be in that frame, and then use that as the pose prior. In the best case, we now just check our LED blobs against the what we see in that frame, lock on instantly, and we're done in a millisecond or two, and everything tracks perfectly. Uh, so how does this tie in with what OpenHMD has upstream is a, a simple sensor fusion for, that's focused on doing three degree of freedom tracking. So it only tracks that rot rotation. It doesn't do the integration of position, and it keeps a short history of 20 samples in the past. But as I said, by the time we know where, even, even in the case where we predicted the device position correctly, by the time a camera frame has arrived to us, it takes 17 or 18 milliseconds after the exposure happened. So we're always 17 or 18 milliseconds too late by the time we can verify the position of a device. And we need to correct where that was in the past because the uh, we've been integrating IMU rotations for 17 or 18 milliseconds now. So we need to correct sensor data in the past. And what I've done for that is to implement a, an uncentered Kalman filter that has a large state. Um, the, the, this filter is capable of tracking the rotation of the device. It, takes the acceleration and integrates it to get velocity and integrates it to get position, predicts the position, and then you correct it using the feedback from the camera. It, it uses that information to refine the IMU bias data. And the way that we do prediction in the past is, as well as keep tracking the current position and uh, rotation of the device, I have slots um, at the moment, three slots that track the prior, the previous position of a frame that we are still analysing. 
and the, the this Kalman filter as it integrates new data is maintaining covariance, lagged covariance entries for each of these delayed slots so that when we integrate information from a camera frame 18 milliseconds later, that corrects the information in the lagged slot and the covariance matrices reflect that back through to apply a delta to the current tracked position. And it works really well. Um, I could, if I get time, I can show some nice graphs of, of how well that works. But it is pretty expensive. It chews something like 12% of the CPU running in release. If I compile in release mode, it's chewing something like 12% of my CPU running this filter a thousand times per second for the headset and 500 times per second for each controller because we've got thousand hertz and 500 hertz IMU rates. So I have a future research um, project to figure out what are better ways to do this um, Kalman filter integration or, or the tracking and fusion in a way that will support doing it in the past, not be as expensive on the CPU, but still give the results we need. And another thing I added um, based on Demo's investigations in ESCII was a one euro exponential filter that, so the Kalman filter tracks uh, exactly where we think each device is, but as I said, it's drifting and then being corrected. So it has a jitter, you know, a 17 or 18 millisecond jitter that's not too bad, but does get a little bit annoying in your hands. So I have a, a small bit of uh, exponential smoothing on the pose that we then report to the application that helps make all of that feel a bit less jittery in your hands and, and in your view. How do I debug all this? So I have this, um, Set up at the moment where I can use the Pipewire uh, media service as a export for camera data and also for uh, streams of JSON text blobs. So I, I can have a running OpenHMD application and I can use Pipewire to connect to it and see exactly what the cameras are seeing. I export the raw camera frames and then I have a second pipe wire node that exports annotated you know, views. So it draws crosses and boxes where it's seeing blobs and where it thinks LEDs should be. Um, the goal here is to create a utility where I can say, start recording the session because now the, the kinds of problems I'm in at the moment are that you're doing something in VR, you're you know, playing Beat Saber or something where you're moving your hands fast and suddenly they glitch and your controllers stop tracking. It's really hard to figure out what went wrong when you're in VR and everything happens so quickly you need to be able to look at it outside of real time. So the idea is to be able to record a complete session trace and then step through it frame by frame to see what happened with the tracking and uh, figure out what went wrong. So that's the goal. I have had some trouble getting the text streams out of Pipewire in a way that I can save them properly. So uh, I also have given up on that very recently and just done something quicker where I integrate um, GStreamer directly into OpenHMD and record the camera traces and the text JSON streams out to an MP4 file. I have a what I call a fabulous hack um, where I treat a stream of JSON data for each tracked device that contains the IMU information and our predictions and our tracking information. And I save that as a subtitle track in an MP4 file alongside my video data. Um, it means that if I play the files in VLC, I get JSON blobs shooting over the top at a thousand hertz. But, um, it works. It's not, it's not cursed if it works, is it? But the goal is to be able to then use that in a utility where I can step through frame by frame and test variations. So this is how, this is this, what I've been working on. There's, there's a few more bits to, um, to get done in OpenHMD and a lot of upstreaming to do, but it really, 
what I wanted to get to is how this applies to North Star. And so now I need to talk a bit about inside out tracking uh, because that's what Rift S does, that's what the North Star does, that's what the Quest does. Uh, so now we have cameras in the Rift, in the case of the Rift S, we have five cameras. There's two at the front, one's pointing down into the sides, and there's one on the top looking at the roof. And these cameras are simultaneously localizing the headset and tracking the controllers. So about a year ago, um, when, you know, a, a couple of months after I got my Rift S, I spent a month of weekends staring at USB traces from the Rift S and getting it to the point where I have enough of the protocol understood that I can do three degree of freedom tracking for that. Uh, we can talk to the controllers, we can look at the camera feeds, and we found I found something very interesting as I was doing this. The cameras on the Rift S, uh, they run through an FPGA inside the device, and it's capturing all five of those cameras simultaneously and then dropping them into a single frame buffer for you to read back from. So you don't have separate camera devices, you just have one camera device with all of the frames combined. That's That's nice. Now we don't have the problems I've had with CV1 where I have to correlate USB arrival times to figure out what belongs with what quite so much. Uh, second, they alternate every second frame because they have the cameras tightly integrated and they have the control over the camera exposure uh, trigger. They swap, they change the configuration of the camera every second frame to alternate between a, a room bright exposure where you can track features of the room and do your slam tracking. And then every second frame, they turn on the controller LEDs with the radio sync and blink the controller LEDs. So it's hard to see in this photo, but the controller LEDs are not on in the room exposure frame, but they are turned on for the tracking frame. Also, we have a bunch of binary data across the top that tells us which frame is which. The, the exposure times and whether things were turned on or not. And finally, so that means so that means we have 30 hertz room tracking and 30 hertz controller tracking. And um, I have some indication, I think, or at least I have a theory that in Quest 2, they have recently enabled 60 hertz hand tracking. And I think all they're doing there is to turn off this uh, alternating exposure uh, for controller tracking and just doing 60 hertz bright room tracking things to track hands. So that's another bit of cleverness they've, they've come up with. So the difference between what I'm doing for CV1 and an inside out tracker is getting VIO slam tracking for the headset. And, you know, we've got lots of people looking at that for, for different reasons. We're looking at it with these uh, cameras from um, the Deft AI Exonus camera sets. I want to get it working for Rift S. I'd like to get it working for Windows Mixed Reality headsets. And, and if I have a VIO for the headset, finding the controllers could be similar to what I've already been doing for, for CV1, but I think perhaps I can do better. With CV1, I'm analyzing each frame from each camera separately, and that works because each camera has a good view of the play space and we, we generally can see an entire device. But with the inside out tracking, I think it's more likely that controllers will cross camera frames and be only partially visible. So it would be better perhaps to build a, a set of bearing vectors uh, for every available blob and then come up with a similar sort of uh, depth search to match bearing vectors against 3D models instead of 2D blob positions against 3D models. All the frames are available synchronously, so that's, that's nice. Um, big problem though, Rift S and CV1 controllers, because they have this custom radio protocol, I, we could maybe reverse engineer that protocol, but they're not the best candidate for something like a North Star controller. On the other hand, you can buy Windows Mixed Reality controllers separately and they have a known Bluetooth 
um, protocol we can talk. And they have a similar LED constellation kind of idea. The big difference is that Windows Mixed Reality controllers have white visible light LEDs that are constantly on and you view them with a standard camera instead of an infrared synchronized one. That means that the blob extraction step is harder because now we're not just seeing the LEDs like we do with the Rift. We're seeing a whole room and some spots in it that are visible. But I don't think it's that. It, it, I think it's plausible. And certainly we know it's plausible because Windows Mixed Reality tracks these controllers this way. Um, it also means we can, we, we ha would be free to do things like having external cameras, um, viewing the scene uh, and transmitting information in a, addition to headset mounted cameras. But if we wanted to go with headset only, I think we need to consider that uh, like with Rift S and, and Windows Mixed Reality, you, um, with the HP G2, you need more than just front facing cameras. And, in, and the bigger the field of view of those cameras, the better your chances of seeing LEDs. Uh, even with my G2, if I maintain a comfortable resting pose with my controllers down around waist level, they're out of sight of my tracking cameras and, and the controller tracking glitches. A wide FOV is very important for this stuff. These are little example, just a quick, I took a photo with the, the Luxonus uh, grayscale camera, grabbed a screenshot and then ran it through an edge detection. And because we have this nice black ring around the LEDs, we have a, a pretty good chance, I think, of just using an algorithm that looks for uh, bright transitions and white lights and then extracts blob regions. We only need four of them to generate a, a valid hypothesis for the position and some more to validate that hypothesis. So what do you think? Windows Mixed Reality controllers for North Star? I, ha I was going to do demos, but I only have two minutes left also here, so I will take questions instead. If anyone has any. Yeah, uh, I, I agree with uh, Windows Mixed Reality controllers for North Star. I think they make a lot of sense. I've worked with them in the past. Um, they do consume batteries quite easily. So I'm wondering if there's like a way we could like hack them <laughs> and replace them with more energy efficient LEDs or a better LED system. Um, yeah, so that's that's the really clever thing with the Oculus devices, right? By blinking the LEDs brightly only when the camera frame is being exposed, they save all of that battery in between. And I think that's the the big reason that Oculus controllers are so much more battery efficient. Um, however, that relies on having a broadcast radio signal that synchronizes the blinking with your camera exposure. And that is a tricky thing to propose. So no, I'm not entirely sure that saving batteries is, is that feasible with the existing Windows Mixed Reality controllers. Especially if you've got unsynchronized cameras, you know, if you've, if you've got synchronization between all of your headset based cameras, you could maybe do some phase locking stuff to turn on LEDs for a window around where your exposures are happening. But if you want to add external cameras, then you're not going to have synchronized feeds. Reverb G2 controllers have been generally better about battery life than the older ones. I don't know if that's true. Can you use can you use low exposure or short exposure with the WinMR controllers? Have you tried anything with that? They look kind of bright, so I wonder if you can just do the same trick there with short low exposures. Possibly. Um, we do know that Windows Mixed Reality tracking is much more susceptible to you having uh, too bright a lighting in your room and therefore washing out the controller rings, whatever you do, or uh, bright windows in the area that make it impossible to track the controllers when you wave across them. Um, doing some kind of adaptive exposure tracking might work, but it will be at the cost of losing room features that you want for your slam tracking. Um, so you will still I, need I to alternate. A little bit. 
uh, to the Windows Mixed VR controllers was it? I'm going to deal with that a lot when I build VR demos for them. Um, there was a particular situation where I was demoing them in a building uh, that was next to a train track that had very bright LEDs, which equivalent were pretty much equivalent to the color and brightness of the LEDs in the controllers from the distance away we were. Um, essentially, whenever the window was open or not covered by a curtain, the Windows Mixed Reality heads couldn't track any. Like, like there was not, it, it just like failed to grab the controller at all. It was just very confused. Um, and I, th I do think that's a limitation of, of their system. Um, but, you know, I do want to say that, you know, we're at a place where we definitely can use existing controllers. We also have a lot of knowledge and expertise on building our own, um, which we could do. I mean, they would probably be 3D printed for at least a good portion of their life. As far as LED configurations go, I think we can we have enough people here to uh, figure out you know which ones work best for the methods that we have. So if there's anything that you would want to see that would make your life easier, uh, Jan, we can definitely do that. To some extent, I'm I'm just throwing ideas out there because I've I've only actually been implementing CV1 and thinking about how to do inside out tracking for these other ones but i haven't gotten to it yet so a lot of it is just hand wavy thought clouds uh, i have a question there do i think that machine learning could be used to do the prediction step from the imu data i have seen somewhere in the last year a, a machine learning based um, tracking thing and they got good results from the from doing that integration but I wasn't convinced that it was a win over doing it analytically, um, especially trying to run a thousand times a second. You, you don't get a particularly big neural model for that kind of uh, update rate. So I don't know, but that, the outside my area of expertise for uh, coming to my talk. I'll uh, hand it back over 